This is my little kid moment. I can't believe I'm on a TED stage. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs> the fault, dear Brutus, lies not in the stars, but in ourselves. Can't hurt to start with Shakespeare. Look around you. All of you have so much in common, your, your ingenuity, your, your creativity, your inquisitiveness. What interests me, though, the most is that all of you are here in this room today from a thousand, from 2,000 different places. You all managed to get here this morning. Now, some of you didn't have any trouble at all. You knew exactly where you were going. Um, uh, you probably knew some shortcuts. Um, you might have been able to avoid all the construction that's out there. Others of you may have needed just a little bit of help, um, downloading directions off the web, maybe looking at a map. Some of you perhaps got lost on the way, had to make adjustments, maybe even ask directions. You don't have to confess to that, by the way. Lots of you may have used your GPS to get here. We all have them. They're free. They come on smartphones, on your dashboard, in your phone. They're pretty much a universal item. This is my prop. Now, I'm a geographer. Uh, I've been a professional geographer. I was trained in geography. Um, I'm fascinated by the connection between people and their surroundings. I was um, able to work with GPS back in the old days before any of the satellites were up. Um, I worked on street and address databases back when they were big and expensive enough that only government could have them. And I actually did an arcane art called geocoding, which is taking a mailing address and putting it on a location uh, precisely on a map. In all of these areas, I am so blown away today by how much power and how much information is sitting in that little package on my smartphone. I'm also, as a geographer, a little bit worried about that. Now, for me to explain how I'm worried, let's tease apart GPS just a little bit. What we call GPS is actually a complex layered system. Everything from a constellation of satellites to, to databases to receivers and algorithms, um, interface tools. But they answer the three fundamental questions of navigation. Where am I? Where am I going? And how do I get there from here? Where am I? Point A is from GPS proper. So a chip about the size of your little fingernail receives signals from the global positioning satellites that provide fantastically accurate time differences that pinpoint your location to about three meters. So not just what street you're on, but what lane you're in. Next, point B, the destination. Well, there's a big database, a big detailed database of address ranges and addresses and, and landmarks, and you select where your destination is. Now, getting from point A to point B takes a couple pieces. One is that cartographic database, the digital map that has street segments, street types, average velocities, you name it, left turn restrictions, and then a, an algorithm typically a proprietary algorithm, but it optimizes a travel path through that network. And typically it does that by minimizing travel time. Then you've got the interface, both visual and auditory, and that keeps you on your path, maybe puts you back on your path, and lets you know when you've gotten to your destination. So really, it's that simple, point A, point B, how to get between the two. But here's the thing. For 10,000 generations of human evolution, we have been doing exactly that with nothing more than our wits and our eyes, our curiosity, and a survival instinct. We are all map makers. We all live to explore. From the moment that you could move, you have been building a cognitive map, a mental map, 
that is a reflection of your perception of your surroundings, the surroundings you operate in, and surroundings even beyond that. Um, I have a mental map of Africa, but I've never been to Africa. Now, your mental map is intensely personal. It is unique, more than a snowflake. It is, it is a lifelong project. It's one that evolves throughout the course of your life. And it gives you a certain sense of, um, of confidence in being able to move around in your environment, which is something that we have had to do ever since we climbed down out of the trees and gazed out on the savanna. But a mental map is more than just mapping. A couple of my old colleagues at the Smithsonian did this clever little study of school kids uh, having a field trip at the National Zoo in Washington, D.C. Now, a week or so before the field trip, they went to the school, split the class up in half. Psychologists do that. Half the class got an orientation to, uh, I don't know, what pandas eat for lunch and, and, and how prairie dogs whistle at each other. You know, zoo stuff. The other half of the class got an orientation to the environment of the zoo, where the field trip would take them, what they could expect along the way, where they'd have lunch, the restrooms, gift shop. A couple weeks after the field trip, they went back and tested the students on their retention of the zoo stuff. Now, you know where this is headed. The kids who had the orientation to their environment had a significantly more durable memory of the subject matter. So when your environment is covered, when you have a mental map that gives you that level of confidence, then you can actually get on with the important stuff. It helps to eliminate that stress, that, that adrenaline surge, fight or flight kind of stress that you experience when you get that primal human fear of becoming lost. Now, mental maps are also cross-cultural. I'm sure you've heard of these wonderful tales of, of navigation across trackless wilderness by the Inuit in the Arctic or, or the Kung Bushmen of the Kalahari Desert. Um, traditional watermen on Chesapeake Bay or the Pulawat Islanders, the navigators in the Caroline Islands who do these fantastic sailing voyages between these little specks of island. All of those navigators have this powerful and well-defined innate ability to build a detailed and usable functional mental map and also to extract cues out of the environment, real subtle directional orientational cues. But here's the thing. You and I have exactly that same innate capacity to build a detailed map, to extract cues from our environment, and to use those tools to navigate, to get from point A to point B. We simply read our map, we determine where the destination is, we orient ourselves to it, we make corrections along the way, right? All this sounds pretty familiar, doesn't it? Or we just punt and go back to our GPS. In spring of 2010, a couple from Penticton, BC, up in the interior, took a trip to Las Vegas. Now, they wanted a backroads view of the great American West. They followed their GPS and eventually wound up stranded, marooned, in the high desert of Nevada. And it was still kind of wintertime. Now, this is a tragic story. One of that couple did not survive it, and the other one uh, was only rescued by accident, really, after 49 days uh, in the desert. Now, of course, not all stories of the, the unintended consequences of trusting your GPS too much have that kind of, of um, tragic ending. More often, it's uh, annoying or irritating or time-wasting, uh, embarrassing, foolish, like the poor guy, and you can't make this stuff up, 
the poor guy in Fairbanks, Alaska, who was trying to go to the Fairbanks airport and ended up following his GPS right down the runway. <laughs> Don't do that in America. <laughs> um, the, the, the people who drive off ferry docks because the GPS told them to, right? And I am, I am using the plural because that's happened more than once. But in the real world, one in three drivers reports having been misled by their GPS. And I bet that number is actually higher. And in a recent study, believe it or not, over 40% of the instructions that were given by the GPS were wrong in the sense that they didn't match with the expectations or the intentions of the driver. Okay, can't make this stuff up. Last night, I stood outside the theater, asked my GPS to give me a walking route back to my hotel, six blocks away. Straight line, by the way. It gave me incredibly detailed walking directions for a 2,400-mile route. <laughs> it estimated it would take 33 days. <laughs> to the exact correct address that I keyed in, in a small town in Louisiana. You, you can't make this stuff up. Now, there are negative consequences of trusting GPS. There are also things that can go wrong with GPS itself. Roads can be obsolete. Um, the opposite can happen. You can have paper streets that haven't even been built yet. Address ranges can be duplicated. All kinds of stuff can happen. You can run over your smartphone, no matter how good the system is, right? You could drop it into the harbor. Um, then the GPS stops working altogether. Now, I'm not really trying to set up a straw man here. I'm not trying to, to beat up on GPS because it is an absolutely amazing, magical thing. It's unbelievable how much information is in there and how it extracts the information that you need and displays it, serves it up in what might be a really high workload environment in the automobile. That being said, it needs to be addressed with a little bit of common sense and a little bit of skepticism. Uh, one of the um, deputy sheriffs who was involved in the search and rescue effort for that couple in the Nevada desert put it really succinctly. He said, you got to stop looking at the screen and look out the window every once in a while. So GPS isn't, isn't inherently bad, but if we consider it to be a closed system, then there are going to be problems with it. Now, all of you have probably heard about automation bias. That's the, the situation that occurs with some um, uh, pilots and radiologists, you know, people who rely on expert systems. They start to impor, impart a sense of authority to what the machine tells them to do. They develop some blind spots. On top of that, when we hand over a skilled task to a machine, we tend to start losing situational awareness. We become passive. If we don't exercise our mental maps, if we don't actively navigate, those mental maps, that birthright that we have, is going to start to diminish. We're going to start to lose them. Now, don't underestimate this. There's another of these great studies where they split the group in half. Half the subjects sat in a wheelchair. The other half pushed them around. Unfamiliar environment, but they followed exactly the same route. And you can see where this one's going too, right? The people who pushed the wheelchairs, the active participants in the environment, developed robust and durable mental maps. The other folks didn't. <clears throat> so here's my point. We need to engineer the technology so that it's better, so that it's more individualized, so it's more like our mental maps. On top of that, we need to engineer ourselves to trust in our own common sense, to put a little distance between us and our GPS, not to stop using them. Maybe we could even use some old school 
um, analog technology, a map. Keep it handy. But most importantly, remember that you're part of the system and that that's the way that we, need, that we get to maintain our legacy, keep ourselves in the driver's seat. The fault, dear navigator, lies not in the stars, but in ourselves. It's up to us, not our tools, to keep us in that driver's seat. Thank you.